Warning, listening to Unleash Your Genius can be good for your health. Symptoms may include looking and feeling better. More energy, healthier kids, and increased productivity. Unleash Your Genius podcast brings you the science, art, and philosophy of health, wellness, epigenetics, and lifestyle. Stronger, fitter, faster. Naturally, holistically, simply. Hey, what's up, Genius listeners? My name is Dr. Brian, and please help me introduce my next guest, Dr. Greg Emerson. Who's a, he's a father, he's a proud father, um, he's a medical specialist, he's a permaculture farmer, he is a sustainable living advocate, and a wilderness survival enthusiast. He's interviewed regularly on America's most popular health television shows because of his dedication to finding the underlying root cause of illness. When not working at his clinic, you can probably find him working in his garden, caring for his animals, or roaming the wilderness, practicing his survival skills. Please help me welcome Dr. Greg Emerson. Dr. Emerson, how are you today? I'm doing absolutely great. Hey, Dr. Emerson, I know I introduced you, but can you expand on that a little bit more? Tell us a little bit more about you. Right. Well, I was thinking about when I was driving in today, and I've kind of realized I'm always kind of this, I've always been a kind of a hybrid you know, at school I was uh, academic, but I was also a top basketball player. And then when I uh, when I qualified as a doctor, I was working as a doctor, but I was also playing professional basketball. So I had to kind of learn how to fit into both groups pretty well. And then, of course, I specialized in medicine. But now, and then as well as specializing in medicine, I also then decided to go off and learn about natural medicine. And, you know, sure, on one hand, I'm you know, sometimes uh, I, you know, used to be resuscitating a trauma patient, but I was also learning how to, you know, harvest wild foods and forage thistle root. Um, and now I've kind of combined it all together in this kind of crazy hybrid of of Western scientific medicine, uh, you know, outdoors, wilderness living, uh, and finding your adventurous spirit again, and natural health. And I kind of enjoy always kind of having a, a foot in many camps and not being pigeonholed in one ear. I kind of find it really exciting looking at the similarities between all three things and not going, okay, these things are all kind of different. That's a bit weird he's involved. I'm going, no, you can learn a lot from each of those groups. So it's been a very exciting journey for me. Right, yeah, you have a really unique perspective on health coming from the emergency medicine and then from the holistic, you know, treat the cause Type of thing was there a was there a something specifically that happened like a paradigm shift or had you always just kind of been open minded that way? Well, no, I, I know I hadn't. I mean, I didn't. I started off kind of, but you know, my initial motivation was to kind of prove that I could do the hardest job, which is you know why I ended up. It was kind of my ego thing, really. Um, I you know, ended up flying around in trauma helicopters in Edmonton in Canada. Um, and, uh, but after that, eventually, um, I think probably there are several routes for, for healthcare professionals to end up taking a more natural route. And, and as one is kind of, uh, you just, you, you kind of grow up in the environment or two, you get sick yourself and eventually kind of leaving the, the, living the very high stressful life that I had you know, running the Royal Brisbane Emergency Department, eventually I started to get sick. And this was at a time when, when the whole world was been giving you know poor nutritional advice about how we should eat a lot of carbohydrates and eggs were bad for you and butter was bad for you, so you know we were all starting to get sick. I had this very stressful job, and and eventually I started to get so unwell that I was finding it difficult to work, and uh, I, I realised eventually what was wrong with me, and I discovered there was this kind of what I thought then was a small niche group of people who had unexplained illnesses that I might be able to help get better. Uh, and then, of course, as you once you get out into that world, in fact, you don't find it's a small niche group. You find it's the vast majority of people have unexplained illnesses. And sure, medicine might give them a convenient label, but, but it's done nothing really about getting um, the, getting to bottoms of getting to the bottom of why the problems occurred in the first place. And, but I can also use the things that I've learned from being a farmer and the things I've learned from, you know, training in the wilderness to kind of combine it all and do it. It doesn't have to be separate. It fits in together really well. So to summarize your answer, it was really my own journey of poor, poor, the poor nutritional advice we all got combined with 
an overly stressful job which led to an illness which decided that, that I had something more to offer the population than just picking them up at the bottom of the cliff once they've fallen off the cliff. Right. Hey, Dr. Uh, Emerson, you talked about being a farmer. Can you tell us the difference between a, an organic farmer and a permaculture farmer? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, organic, as we both know, is just minimizing your use of uh, toxic chemicals on the farm. And then there's kind of biodynamic farming, where as well as uh, avoiding uh, the, the toxic chemicals, you're also uh, improving the soil and, and using some uh, cycles of the environment to uh, help uh, increase um, productivity. And there's kind of permaculture farmer, which is, which is kind of how do I organize the farm, which instead of robbing from the environment, I am going to leave the land a better place than when I came on it. How do I organize my farm so I'm adding to the environment? I, was, I like reading a lot of the, the Tom Brown survival, Tom Brown Jr. survival books, and he always talks about how, uh, how the Apache Indian who had taught him encouraged him to be a caretaker of the earth rather than a parasite. So I'm always thinking on my farm, how do I, how do I leave this 50 acres uh, a better place when I'm finished rather than having it robbed of, it of its soil minerals and, 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 and taken from the earth? I want to, I want to leave it a, my, small, my small, small contribution to leaving the world a better place for my two daughters. That's what permaculture is. How do I work with the environment to make so I can take something from it, but also give a lot back to it? Beautiful. And your farm is it? Uh, is it producing for your family, or do you supply to uh, to your community as well? Uh, no, probably not, because I, I I still work uh, full time as a doctor, so I'm here five days a week, twelve hour days, and then I run around like a blue ass fly in the weekends trying to be a, a permaculture farmer. So if I can, uh, my goal is to be, you know, as close to 100% self-sufficient in food for me and my family as I can. Great. But uh, no, no, I, you know, I think, I think uh, earning an income from farming is a, uh, is a stress level. I admire the people that do it, but whew, it's going to be uh, stressful if you're reliant on rainfall and, Southeast Queensland to earn an income. It can be very stressful for people. Right. I admire the people that do it. Yeah, it's got to be tough. Hey, can Dr. Emerson, can you tell us about, I heard or read recently that you trained with the Apache Indians? Yes. Well, I've done, I've done a lot of survival training. Uh, and again, I try and, I try and learn from as any, many experts as possible. You know, and I was reading a book the other day about a, um, a, a outdoorsman in the, in the West by the name of Ber Berman and a uh, famous outdoorsman. And he was talking about how he had trained with the Apache. And, uh, he said the, what was his name? His name was Frederick Russell Burnham, and he had trained with the Apache, and he said, look, I want to learn my survival skills from somebody who rides in the saddle and not sits in the armchair. And I thought, that's exactly, that's exactly what I've been doing. And, you know, I've done a lot of survival training with um, some SAS uh, veterans. You know, if I want to learn how to survive in the wilderness, I'll learn from somebody who did it for 10 years behind lines in Afghanistan. I have great admiration for... The military. I come from a military family. Uh, my grandfather was in the navy at Dunkirk, and my father served in Malaysia, and my brother served in Iraq. So, I kind of wanted to learn from guys who who've been in the saddle and not the armchair. And then I had an opportunity recently uh, on a trip to Arizona to spend some time in the desert with uh, an Apache elder. Uh, who had been raised for a lot of his life in their traditional ways and was able to impart some of his knowledge on me. And it was fascinating because the real fascination for me in the work that I do is, is seeing how much of our intrinsic knowledge that we had developed over thousands of years, now science is just starting to learn about. I mean, the, the, the Apache are talking about eating foods high in medicine. They're talking about... Um, you know, uh, cold water exposure, and they're talking about uh, sweat lodges, and you know now 
We're talking about cold water exposure, increasing brown fat levels and increasing the mitochondria in your cells so you get better energy and a better immune system. And I'm going, all we're really doing now is using science to show that a lot of of our traditional health practices, which have been lost for many years, actually have really good rationale scientifically as to why they've worked for so many years. So learning off people who have a traditional knowledge has always been a great goal of mine. So I try and do it with the military and traditional populations because I think those two are the people who spend most of the time in the saddle, less time in the armchair. Yeah, it's amazing how you, it seems like we lose those, those ideas from the elders and then uh, they start to become popular again. Well, I think everybody's kind of realized that we have gone off on the wrong track for a long period of time. And, you know, we, we, we listen to people who were thought to be experts, but in the end, you know, weren't experts at all. You know, we were told that margarine was good for you and butter was bad and eggs caused heart disease. And it didn't really matter what you eat. Cancer just came along out of the blue. And you know, now we've realized that that's, that's a nonsense and uh, we, we were led off in the wrong way. And, you know, people, people still do it now. They, 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 I still get a lot of people coming to see me and I say, look, you need to make some bone broth to help with your joints and heal your gut. And there's a huge proportion of people who don't even know what bone broth is, uh, let alone how to put some chicken bones in some water and, and soak the, soak the uh, medicine out of the bones. And, of course, what we do in medicine is we say, well, bone broth's really good for you, but that's a bit inconvenient for people to make. So we'll take what we think are the active ingredients out of bone broth, the glucosamine and the chondroitin, stick them in a little capsule and sell them to people, and then wonder why it doesn't work as well as bone broth. And what we forget is there's another you know, 100,000 elements in bone broth that we don't even know what they do that makes the glucosamine and chondroitin work well. And, and homo sapiens have become addicted to comfort in taking the easy route and we would rather take a capsule than uh, put some chicken bones in a slow cooker and I think we're now finding that there aren't any shortcuts um, to some of these things and we need to go back well no we can never go back can we you and I can't go back to being a hunter together it's just not possible but we can learn how to adapt adapt our new lives so that we can incorporate some of that traditional knowledge into our new lives and, and you know, make ourselves healthier and the world a better place. Can you tell us a little bit more about your clinic, the Treat, your, treat the Cause Clinic? When you start getting into medicine, you realize that other than acute medicine, you've had a car accident, you've got a knife sticking out of your chest, you're having a heart attack you actually realize that most medicine is made up of labels, which don't really describe what is causing the problem. You know, you can it can be as obvious as something like idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Idiopathic means I don't know what's causing. Cardiac is your heart. Myo is muth- muscle. Pathy is stuff. So idiopathic cardiomyopathy translates to, to I don't know why your heart muscle is stuffed. Irritable bowel. I don't know why your bowel is irritable. Um... Even, but, but things like asthma, what does asthma mean? Asthma is not a condition. Asthma means, um, asthma means your airways constrict inappropriately for an unknown cause. Then, of course, you've got this epidemic of behavioral disorders, which we're sticking labels on all the time and calling it spectrum disorders, asperges, autism, uh, ADHD, many a times which have an underlying biochemical or physiological or microbiological cause is the problem. So my clinic's about, okay, let's not, let's not just label with you and give you a prescription for a medication which is going to help control your symptoms, like giving you a puffer for your asthma or a blood pressure for your hypertension. And what's hypertension? Hypertension just means my arteries are a bit stiff, which therefore means that my heart has to pump at a higher pressure to supply my vital organs with blood and I don't know why syndrome. Well, we, we'll come here and we'll go, okay, why are your arteries getting stiff in the first place and what we can do to address that so you don't need to be on blood pressure medication for the rest of your life. So almost all conditions come here because acute conditions don't come here. Actually, sometimes they're lifestyle, but other times, you know, I always say to people, there's, there's kind of modern medicine which is very good at acute medicine, which is... You've had a car accident, you should go to the emergency department. We are really good at putting people back together again. And then there's kind of 
natural medicine, which is I'm going to honor the intrinsic wisdom of the body and I'm going to provide it with a good lifestyle and the intrinsic healing of the body will be allowed to take place. But there's a big group of people, and that works often. If, you're, if your illness is caused by lifestyle, then lifestyle will change it. As a friend of mine says, you're never going to prescribe your way out of a, a disease caused by lifestyle. But there's also a big group of people stuck in the middle where, where they have a problem, whether it be microbiological or physiological or anthropological or genetic, which means that even if they do uh, adopt a lifestyle consistent with health, they still don't get better, and that's because there is something which is sabotaging their efforts at getting better, which needs to be identified uh, so that they can um, reap, reap. You want to set them up for success. So when they do make their li- hard, work hard and make their lifestyle choices changes, they they're, they're met with success rather than disappointment. Right. I mean, if you've got a, if you've got a nasty parasite in your gut, it's unlikely that you are going to um, be able to fix that by just changing your diet and getting more exercise. If you have a chronic infection in your brain predisposing to Alzheimer's disease, it's probably going to need some intervention. If you've got a genetically elevated lipoprotein A level in your blood, which is causing inflammation in your arteries, if you've got a genetic position predisposition to thyroid problems, those are things which are going to have to be identified fixed so then when you do make your lifestyle changes you're made with success and everybody wants success yes so when somebody comes to see you they would it sounds like there would be a lot of examination a lot of uh, would there be some pretty thorough testing um, yeah the, 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 by the time most people get here people tend to come here when they've been everywhere else first this is unfortunately kind of in a way unfortunately in a way it, it's the last resort clinic people come here when they've seen everybody else but it, it's, it's sometimes very easy I mean I see people all the time who come in and say look I've got numbness in my legs my MRI is normal no one can work it else what it is and I say oh well, have a seat how are you doing and they say well I'm doing okay and I say what sort of work do you do and they say well I work in a lead mine and I say has anybody tested your lead level and they say no, or sometimes it might work out west, and I say, you know, what's your life like? And they say, well, I get bitten by 20 ticks every day, and I say, has anybody tested you for a chronic tick-borne illness? And they say no, or what's the house like you live in? Oh, it's full of mold. Anybody tested you for mold? No. So sometimes um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly evident, and generally I'll, I'll find out what the problem is within the first five minutes and then spend the rest of the time taking a history to uh, prove that and then designing a series of tests to confirm it because I don't guess. The good thing about what I do is I, I do more testing than your average specialist and I use science to prove my hypothesis correct because that's the good thing about science. Even though people have this bad idea about science sometimes is it's led us down the right track. It has given us some extraordinary diagnostic tools to prove the case that I'm trying to make. Right. Yeah. Someone comes to you as, and they say, you know, look, my grandfather died of heart disease. Uh, my father has heart disease. And I know that uh, I'm going to end up with heart disease. How would you, how would you respond to that? Well, I mean, they, they, they almost certainly are, aren't they, with the attitude? I mean, you know, so the first thing is you've got to, and I write about this all the time because it's the same in, when you're out in the wilderness. The most important thing in a survival situation in the wilderness is your um, state of mind, your mental attitude, and uh, it's the same thing in health. The the most important thing is your mental attitude. And even even with genetics now, the whole genetics thing died off because people realized, well, genetics don't really give us the answer. It's the epigenetics where all the excitement is, which is sure you've got the genes for this. My dad had a bypass operation at 60, and now he's in a dementia unit in New Zealand. Uh, but there is no part of me which says that that is what is going to happen to me, even if I have the genes for it. Uh, because I know there are some changes that I can make which will prevent those occurring. So if I saw somebody who had a genetic history of um, heart disease, I would be looking at the 
genetic risk factors because heart disease in the end, any the first the first chapter of any cardiology textbook is that heart disease is caused by inflammation of the coronary arteries. So you take a step back, well, what's causing the inflammation? And there's about 18 different risk factors, of which cholesterol is not one of them, which causes the inflammation of the arteries. In fact, cholesterol is what goes in to reduce the inflammation. So getting rid of cholesterol is exactly the same as saying, every time I see a fire, I see lots of firemen. I think those firemen are bad news and I'm going to get rid of firemen. Well, that's not a very good idea. Uh, nor is it a good idea to get rid of the cholesterol. The cholesterol is there to help us. It's just because nobody does anything about the underlying inflammation, the cholesterol ends up getting inflamed as well. So I've got to identify those 18 risk factors, uh, which is pertinent to that person, and then fix them. That might be because I've got high lipoprotein A levels. Now, you ask your cardiologist, how do you... Why, why didn't you test me for lipoprotein A? They would say, well, that's because there's no treatment for it. What they're actually saying is there's no drug treatment. But, of course, uh, this, some guy called Linus Pauling came along and showed that vitamin C and lysine stopped the, the um, lipoprotein A inflaming the wall of the artery. The, the number one expert in high blood pressure management, Dr. Mark Houston, who works in Nashville uh, Hospital in the U.S., he said, if you're not investigating heavy metals as a cause of coronary cardiovascular disease, you're missing the boat. And, and most of these patients have got mercury fillings in their mouth, which are leaking out. And, and, and then the, the, the second chapter of any cardiology textbook is dental infections. But I don't know any cardiologist who checks people for dental infections and looks to see if their root canals are infected. So if you just go through a checklist of what are the things which might be inflaming my coronary arteries, and just because your dad had mercury fillings and your grandfather had mercury fillings doesn't mean it's genetic. Just because your dad ate margarine and not butter um, doesn't mean it's genetic. It just means that, that everybody's making the same mistake because we've been given poor advice. I, I'd like to shift a little bit, and I want to put you underneath the spotlight. And I give me the spotlight. Give you the spotlight. I like it. So I want you to imagine that you've been invited to speak in front of 500 men and women that are just about to embark on their first ever lifestyle challenge. You know, they're going to start eating right. They're going to exercise. They're going to start meditating. What would three things that you would want to cover in that speech um, to help ensure that they had the best chance of success and why? Number one change your identity. Uh, I have found that is the most powerful way of changing your behaviors. Um, if it becomes, if a, if a lifestyle change becomes part of your identity, like there are lots of things that you and I would never, ever do, ever do, because it's part of our ident identity that we are not like that. And there is under no circumstances would we ever do that. And if that becomes, if the lifestyle, if it becomes, I am a person who gets up early in the morning and does 20 minutes of exercise every day, if that becomes part of your identity, you will absolutely do that. If I'm a person who does not drink uh, soft drinks ever, and that becomes part of your identity, it's much more than just setting a goal. You have to actually make it part of your, you know, your, your psychological genetic makeup. So Develop an identity which is consistent with your goals would be my number one tip. Number one, two, number tip, number, number two tip would be to make sure you understand your life purpose. And one of my favorite books ever is a book called Resilience, written by an ex Navy SEAL called Eric Greitens, who's actually running for governor in Missouri at the moment. And he found that one of the big problems with all the veterans coming back from military service was that when they got into real trouble was when they kind of re realized they had lost their life's purpose. Their purpose was to protect and serve, and now that was over, and they were completely lost. And that meant they turned to, you know, drugs and alcohol and homelessness instead. And what they didn't need was they didn't need money. They didn't need shelter. They needed to give it a new life purpose. I mean, so it's the role of these men to protect and serve, and when that's taken from, they end up without a life purpose. And it's the same in a survival situation. The survival literature is very, very clear 
that the person in a survival situation who develops a purpose, who has a purpose, if you're stuck in a right life raft out at sea and you're the person who decides to look after the water sourcing for the rest of the lifeboat, then you are the, mo the, li the most likely person to survive rather than the person who just sits there doing nothing. So it's very, very important to have a life purpose and know what that is. And that life purpose, here's the one criteria. The one criteria is that life purpose is bigger than yourself. You can't just be, my life purpose is to make a lot of money so I can have a nice house. Your life, person, your life purpose has to be bigger than yourself. Now, it doesn't have to be a big life purpose. My, my life purpose is to leave, leave the world a, a better place for my two daughters. I'm not here to make earth-shattering changes, but I have a life purpose that I feel very strongly about. So make sure you know what your life purpose is. It might change with time as mine has, but, and make sure it's bigger than yourself. And and the third one, the third one would be learn some techniques that, as we discussed before, learn some techniques how to adapt adapt our lifestyle, your lifestyle, whether that be business, family, work, to um, overcome perhaps the 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 new world that we live in. We have to learn how to adapt our new world to honor our, the, the knowledge and wisdom that's intrinsic in our genes and, and learn that, learn that from somebody who, who, who rides in the saddle and not sits in the armchair. So in summary, I'd go, make sure you put your goals, make your goals as part of your identity. Two, make sure you know what your life purpose is and it's bigger than yourself. And then learn how to make some adaptations to your new world, which incorporate uh, ancient wisdom and learn it from somebody who uh, lives that life. So unleash your genius is about breaking the chains of our modern lifestyle. We also know that you know, changing habits, changing our lifestyle can be difficult and challenging. Is there anything or any time that you struggled uh, changing your lifestyle? Well, I think there's been a couple of times. Uh, one of the times I spent uh, 20 years as a vegetarian, uh, because spiritually and emotionally I, I found that was the right thing to do. And I always said that I would do that as long as I stayed healthy doing it. But eventually I found that my body was starting to break down prematurely, which is the case for a lot of people who, who go that lifestyle. And, and spiritually I would love to be a vegan and a vegetarian, but I realized that really I had to, if I wanted to do that, I almost certainly had to travel to a different planet which had a different set of physiological rules. And for me, almost certainly, me personally, I'm not saying for anybody else, but me personally, I needed a degree of animal protein if I wanted to function at my optimal. That was a big one. You know, it was a 20 year, again, that had been part of my identity. My identity was that I was vegetarian and I saved the animals. And that was a big one for me to try and have to come to terms with. In the end, it was relatively easy because when my health started to break down, I thought, well, either I can continue with this identity and be, you know, operate at 50% or I would have to change my identity. So that was, and to do that, I did change my identity. I no longer saw myself as a vegetarian. I kind of started to see myself as a, as a traditional hunter-gatherer person uh, who was honouring the earth. And so even though it was a struggle, once, I, once I'd made that change in identity, it actually did become quite easy. But I thought if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it properly. I am going to be responsible for the food I eat and I'm going to be responsible for the animals' lives that I take. I'm not going to leave that to somebody else. So that was probably the biggest one for me when I had a struggle because I had to, I had to change my identity. What's uh, what's your favorite form of exercise now, or how do you how do you approach exercise? Well, I, I you know I think the the world is starting to move, realize too that that natural movements are the way to go. And again, going back to honoring our the the, the knowledge and our genes and, and ancient wisdom that you know perhaps that lying on a bench in a gym pressing a barbell up and down is not the sure it's a great exercise to get. Uh, a muscular chest, but it might not serve you in the long time, long term, very well. And uh, there's this revolution with with natural movements. Do do the climbing, the throwing, the running, the flexibility, the balance exercises that we have done for hundreds of thousands of years 
Uh, and that's what our body is designed for. Again, honour the design of our body. Uh, swinging, uh, throwing uh, are all exercises. So, you know, fortunately living on my farm, I get a great opportunity to, to do that. I'm, I'm up at five in the morning going around and, you know, my exercise in the morning, I don't go to a gym, but I'm out there lifting hay bales. I'm out there tossing uh, great big sacks full of uh, chicken food and I'm out there repairing the fence and I'm over there climbing over some logs uh, and, uh, you know, scurrying over a branch. So my exercise on a formal basis has been that. And I also, again, you have to adapt. So sometimes, I, you know, I, I do a lot of kettleball workout now. And again, well, why have people gone to kettleballs? Because they realize that's much more consistent with our traditional forms of movement and exercise. So again, that's a really good example of sure. Well, that's great, Greg, but I don't have a farm to run around on in the morning. Or, or, or rocks to throw or logs to climb over. But you can adapt your own modern lifestyle to do that. So, okay, well, I'm going to use, learn how to use kettleballs um, instead because that's much more traditional, it approaches much more my traditional movements than perhaps lying on a bench with a barbell. So that's how I kind of get my exercise. And so I, I, I'm, I'm on the farm doing that stuff or I'm uh, in a room with a, with a kettleball or a, a boxing bag doing some boxing and – if it's not that sort of exercise, then um, my my favourite passion it is passion is being in the mountains, and uh, I like to ski, and I like to ski because I really like skiing, but I love being in the mountains in the open. So you've got to make sure that you enjoy your exercise is the other thing because when you adopt a new lifestyle, you have to make sure that you enjoy it. I mean, I always tell people to do a, a juice, but I say you've got to make sure the juice tastes good because if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to do it. You have to find an exercise which you're going to happy to do for the rest of your life. Great point. Is it okay if we hit the bonus round? I, I'd love to hit the bonus round. All right. Can, uh, can you give us uh, some resources like your favorite book? My favorite book, I have two. Can I give you two? Yes. Um, Resilience by Eric Greitens, uh, um, as, which I discussed previously, which was a, was, a, a letter, was a series of letters between him and a friend of his in the Navy SEALs who, who got into trouble after he got home. And it, it's just a great combination of practical and ancient Ancient philosophies, you know, by some of the Stoic philosophers, you know, such as Marcus Aurelius and Socrates and some of those people about how, how they should live their lives. I think I learned a lot from that book. And the other book was uh, or is The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. And I kind of always knew about Theodore Roosevelt, but the more I read about the guy, the more I just uh, admire admire the, the way that man lived his life and what he did with his life. And I, I see some, I suppose I see some parallels with the, with what he did with his life and how I did our life. So I'm just fascinating uh, reading everything about TAR at the moment. But certainly the book which really got me interested in him, which, which blew my mind about how he, what sort of man he was, was The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. I really like books that teach me something and, and of people that I admire that I can then incorporate that sort of stuff in my lifestyle as well. Do you have a favorite quote? Uh, I, well, I, can I give you two? Sure. Uh, I have, um, the course, the one which has probably inspires me uh, on the way I live my life is, is the quote from Gandhi, which was, be the change that you want to see in the world. That's kind of what I think about every day when that's part of my identity now, that quote. Uh, but the, the, the other one is, is, is the great quote from Theodore Roosevelt, um, which is, says, shall I read it out? Yes, please. It says, and I love this, it is not the critic who counts not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again, again, again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, 
at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither who neither know victory nor defeat. And I love that. I love it too. Because as you know, you can take some you can you can attack some, you can attract some critics when you step out of the box in life. And uh, I think uh, that you know sometimes when I need uh, you know a little bit of encouragement to keep doing what I'm doing, you know it's it's a quote like that that really helps me. Right. And sometimes I've been thinking that if you don't have any critics, maybe you're not uh, stepping out of the box enough. Uh, I agree completely. So, Dr. Emerson, is there, um, I just like to wrap things up here. Um, any last thoughts or words of advice? I just, I just think, I think probably, after, you know, seeing it, you know, after elucidating it with you, you know, I really think the take home message of our discussion is that is that you want to make sure that you are adapting our lives now to incorporate some traditional wisdom and you make that part of your identity would probably be the take-home measure. And that's what really excites me about my life. How do I look at my, my life mission? How do I look at the food that I eat? How do I look at the water that I drink? How do I look at where I want to, what do I want to achieve in life, how, do I, how I want to live my life, the body I want to have, the energy I want to have. How do I make some adaptations to this new world, which also incorporates that ancient wisdom, and how do I make that as part of my identity so I do it every day? I think that's probably what really drives me. And how do I share that information with, with other people so that, you know, you know, you and I probably both have some concerns the way the world is, is heading, and, and it's... You know, you and I both know that the, the change that the world needs is not going to be coming from the top. It is not going to be some politician who comes along and says, I think the days of Theodore Roosevelt are over. I don't think anybody's going to come along and say, right, I'm going to turn the ship around. I think the ship will be turned around by a groundswell of individuals who say, we're not going to stand for this anymore. We are going to be the change that we want to see. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. How can people get in touch with you? They can get in touch through with me through my website at www.drgregemerson.com. I have a Facebook page, which is Dr. Greg Emerson's Cedar Springs Farm. And I have a, another website, which is the, uh, the project uh, that a friend of mine and I have set up, which is to reintroduce people back to a more traditional way of life and eating, and we do that in the mountains and rivers around Queenstown in New Zealand where we teach some traditional movements. We teach wild food foraging, traditional food preparation. We teach resilience training, uh, and, uh, and we teach some survival skills in the rivers and mountains around Queenstown, and that website is uh, newageprimal.co.nz, which is a very exciting year of my life currently very exciting i'll have some links to all of those on the show notes of our website uh, as well it's been fantastic having you on the show today dr emerson thank you so much for giving back well thanks for inviting me and thanks for such uh entertaining questions it was uh, i always love doing talk you know speaking about stuff that i'm really passionate about and you and i obviously share the same passion so that's uh it's been very exciting to be involved thank you for inviting me Thanks so much for listening to Unleash Your Genius with your host, Dr. Brian Peterson. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit UnleashYourGenius.com. We'll catch you next time.